Hi, I'm Colin Whiting, and this is Peopling the Past. Today, we're going to be talking about dogs in ancient Greece. And here you can see a couple of visual representations of dogs. Up at the top, there are a couple of black figure hounds chasing a hare. And down below, we see a little white Maltese dog playing with a couple of children. Before we talk about dogs, though, I want to talk about what sources and data I'm going to be looking at today. First and foremost are pieces of art. And this can really range from anything from painted pottery, like we see at the top left here. This is another Maltese playing with a child, to funeral steely, like this in the middle. This is a hound. Or even small terracotta figurines, like this rattle uh, here on the right. Our sources also include plenty of literary references. Greeks loved talking about dogs, loved using dogs as metaphors. They're always talking about dogs. We have short poems like this one from the Greek anthology. The gravestone says that here it guards the Maltese dog, evil as his most faithful guardian. They called him a bull when he still lived, but now the silent paths of night possess his voice. It's a touching little epitaph for someone's pet. We also have an entire uh, document called the On Hunting with Dogs by Xenophon, and that gives us a lot of interesting details about how ancient Greek hunting with dogs worked. For instance, Xenophon describes the perfect hunting dog this way. The head should be light, flat, and muscular. The eyes prominent, black, and sparkling. The forehead broad with a deep dividing line. The ears small and thin, the little hair behind. The neck long, loose, and round. The chest broad and fairly fleshy. The ribs not low down on the ground, but sloping in an oblique line. The tail long, straight, and thin. The thighs hard. The shanks long, round, and solid. I really love descriptions like this because when you actually go back and look at this middle image, you can see so much of what Xenophon says reflected in this depiction of a hunting dog. See how the rib cage sort of slopes up towards the legs, see how the ears are small and pointed. Um, it's a really nice sort of marriage between the Steely's representation and the literary representation that we have of hunting dogs. And lastly, we have physical remains of dogs, which are quite fun. Uh, these range from burials of dogs, like this one up top, to the remains of dogs' paw prints that we find on tiles scattered throughout the ancient Mediterranean. This tile probably would have been laid out in the sun to dry, and while it was being dried, a couple dogs trampled all over it. I want to stress at the beginning that most of the information that I'm going to be presenting today comes from the Athenian Agora. Um, this is not to say that it's only valid for ancient Greece or ancient Athens. It's just the place where I've been doing my research. The Athenian Agora was the civic center of Athens, so it contained most of the government buildings. It was the central marketplace of Athens. It was a religious center of Athens. It had a number of large, important temples, altars, and other sanctuaries. It was also a big working area. There were workshops scattered throughout the Agora, especially up in the Northwest. And it was a large residential area. You can see at the bottom of the plan, there are a lot of houses listed. And as such, it provides us with a really good cross-section of Athenian society. This isn't just a religious area. This isn't just a residential area. This is a sort of everyone in Athens. The bulk of what I'll be talking about though is how this topic can tell us about real people in the past. And the first thing that we need to discuss is the distinction that ancient Greeks drew between Maltese and hounds. And on the left here, you can see a Maltese, which is kind of like a modern Spitz breed, if you're familiar with that. It's a small white dog. And these Maltese dogs are almost always depicted playing with women or children. The second type of dog that ancient Greek authors uh, and artists depicted were uh, hound dogs or hunting dogs. You can see that, um, for instance, these two hunting dogs on the right are depicted much bigger, stronger. Um, and, and this is a distinction that will carry throughout art. And we'll uh, revisit this topic as we continue. Now, Maltese dogs are almost exclusively depicted in Greek art and in literature as pets. For instance, here on the left, we can see yet another Maltese playing with a child. This is a common theme. We always see uh, Maltese dogs playing with children on pots. We hardly ever see them in the company of men. 
And this was not just something that is depicted in art, it seems to have uh, had some sort of um, ramifications in the real world. So for instance, in the center, we have uh, another Maltese, albeit a little bit of a cruder one. And this is actually a child's rattle. It would have been formed by having two pieces of clay, one for each half of the dog, the small pellet placed in between before the clay was fired. And so when the clay was fired, we end up with a hollow dog that has a little pellet inside. It's, it's a baby's rattle, but it's, it, it's, it's interesting that we have a baby's rattle in the shape of what essentially was a child's uh, pet also. Now, these dogs also could be very well taken care of. This is, you know, the, these are aristocratic pets. They're not sort of just street dogs. So for instance, at the right here, we see a very careful burial of a fairly small dog. And the dog was found inside this vase, but what's interesting is that the vase itself was broken in antiquity, then the bones were inserted, and then the vase was remended before it was buried. And what this shows us is that this dog must have been a household pet that was particularly beloved. And somebody went to a lot of care and expense to have this proper burial given to this dog. Now, Maltese, like I said, were very much aristocratic pets, and they're very strongly associated with children and with women. And we have both literary and archaeological evidence of their association with women. So, for instance, uh, Lucian was a uh, satirist who settled in Athens in the second century CE, and he writes this funny little story about a philosopher who was trying to get a job with an uh, aristocratic woman, and she keeps putting these more and more extravagant demands on him. And one of her demands, for instance, she says, Thismopolis, I have a great favor to ask you. Now, please don't say no. and Don't wait to be asked twice. There's a good fellow. Of course, he said he would do anything she wished. I only ask you because I know you're to be trusted. You're so good natured and affectionate. I want you to take my little dog Marina in with you and see that she wants for nothing. Poor little lady. She's soon to become a mother. These hateful, inattentive servants take no notice of me when we are traveling, much less of her. You will be doing me a great kindness, I assure you, in taking charge of her. I'm so fond of the sweet little pet. She prayed and almost wept. Now, it's clear that Lucian is making fun of this woman a little bit, but it's true, at least so far as we can tell, that some women would have had attachment to dogs like this. In this funerary sculpture that you can see on the right here, we actually have a woman depicting herself not with one or two, but actually three little Maltese dogs. Uh, one is on her lap, one is scrambling to get up her legs, and one is under her stool. And so uh, this is a pretty unique piece as far as I can tell. I don't know of any other piece that depicts three dogs on a single person's funerary steely, but whoever this woman was must have really sincerely cared about her pet animals. And the other major type of dog that is depicted on Greek art and discussed in Greek literature are hunting dogs. And these are probably older in that People probably had hunting dogs in Greece before they started importing specialized small breeds like the Maltese. Uh, this is an image of a hunting dog on a Greek herbalist that goes way back. This is one of the earlier pieces from Niagara. And we even have references in some of the oldest Greek literature. So for instance, Homer in the Iliad writes, as when a troop of vigorous dogs and youths is hail from every side, a wild boar issuing forth from a deep thicket, wetting the white tusks within his crooked jaws, they press round and hear his gnashing, Yet beware to come too close to the terrible animal. So rushed the Trojans around Odysseus, the beloved of Zeus. Really gives you a vivid image of how Greek hunting would have worked. Again, I want to emphasize that uh, we, we have great texts that tell us about what hunting dogs should look like and how they should act. The best, again, is Xenophon. This was an Athenian statesman and philosopher who wrote this entire book about how to hunt with dogs. And he tells us that when tracking, they should get out of the game pass quickly, hold their heads well down in a slant, smiling when they find the scent and lowering their ears. And here we can see a hunting dog. He's holding his head down, he's smiling, and he's lowered his ears. And it's great that we can see sort of the, uh, the consistency in how hunting dogs are depicted in literature and in art. Now, this is probably one of my favorite pieces from antiquity. This is a uh, drinking cup that shows a hunting scene next to a shrine. So you can see here a panther is leaping upwards, a dog is jumping up towards the panther, and it's a bit hard to make out because of the break. There's a youth with a spear here who's also attacking the panther. 
So it's not a boar like in the earlier passage, but this really gives us a sort of vivid picture of what hunting in ancient Greece might have looked like, or at least how it was imagined. Now, like I said, this is also on a drinking cup. And we see a little shrine here that has a goddess and she's standing, uh, the statue of the goddess is next to a stag. Now that's a pretty good hint that we're talking about Artemis, who is the goddess of hunting. And an even better hint is the little inscription uh, right above the word hunting dogs. You can see Artemidi in ancient Greek, so for Artemis. Uh, so in a lot of ways, this, this piece really encapsulate, encapsulates the Greek aristocratic ideals. Lavish drinking parties, hunting, and religious piety. Now, these were not the only kinds of dogs in ancient Greece, but they're the ones that are the most commonly depicted. So we know, for instance, that there were plenty of shepherding and guard dogs. Uh, the Roman historian Vero, for instance, I know he's Roman, not Greek, but we'll give him a pass, says that there are two sorts of dogs. The hunting dog suited to the chase, suited to chase the beasts of the forest, and the other, which is procured as a watchdog and is of importance to the shepherd. I think it's worth noting here that Vero doesn't even mention lap dogs. He doesn't even mention Maltese. The fact that there are dogs that might be at home playing with women and children is completely irrelevant to him. But it's also interesting to me that we know that there were Greek shepherd dogs and we know that there were Greek watchdogs, but we hardly ever see them depicted on pottery. They didn't fall into this dichotomy. There are hunting dogs that are shown with men. There are Maltese that are shown with women and children. So the other kind of dogs just simply get alighted, even though, again, these dogs show up in some of the earliest Greek literature. So again, Homer in the Iliad writes, every man sat watchful and in arms as dogs that guard flocks in a sheepfold hear some savage beast that comes through thickets down the mountainside. Loud is the clamor of dogs and men and sleep is frightened beds. We also know that the Greeks occasionally took dogs to war. So on this face, you can see a, a warrior who's accompanied by a dog. He's being seen off probably by a father and mother, but possibly by a god and goddess. And we also have a nice description of Greek war dogs from Elian. Uh, Elian was a Roman historian, but he wrote in Greek. And he says, their hounds used to accompany the people of Hyrcania and Magnesia to war. And in fact, these dogs were an advantage and a help to them. An Athenian took with him a dog, his fellow soldier to the Battle of Marathon. And both are figured in a painting in the Stoa Poikile. Now, the Stoa Poikile is where the Athenians hung paintings of their most important, most valorous deeds, all of their biggest military victories and, and the like. So for a dog to be included in one of those paintings is actually quite an honor. And I just want to point out that behind my head are the remnants of the Stoa Poikile as they've been discovered in the course of excavations at the Agora. Now, I want to cover a couple of fun topics also. First of all, what would you call your dog in ancient Greece? Well, Xenophon tells us that hounds should have short names so that you can call them easily. Psyche, Thymus, Porpax, Styrax. Some of my favorites are Bia, which means force, or Actus, which means sunbeam. Now, we don't have a similar list for what you would call a Maltese dog, but we have a couple examples. Uh, Argos, for instance, in the epitaph at the beginning of this presentation is named after a dog in the Yahtzee. And Marina is a dog that uh, Lucian describes. Now, Marina is a nice contrast because that's not a very sharp, easy to call name. So probably dogs that lived at home were somewhat uh, more flexible with the names. I think this is a nice, interesting uh, place where we can compare uh, modern practices also. So modern dogs might have very long, complicated names, but the most popular are also very short, easy to call names. Spot, Fido, Rex, that sort of thing. Now, Vero also tells us that dogs ate food, obviously. He tells us what kind of food that they ate, which is scraps of meat and bones, not grass and leaves, which also sounds a little obvious. But remember, you couldn't go down to Petco and just buy a bag of kibble. Uh, Xenophon tells us what dogs should wear, says the trappings of hounds are collars, leashes, and belts. The collar should be soft and broad so as not to shape the hounds' as coat. What I really like too is that you can see dogs as collars on them in a lot of Greek pottery. So for instance, these two dogs have very, very distinct collars. Now, as I uh, noted earlier, dogs played a part in Greek worship. Sometimes this was very obvious. So for instance, uh, Artemis was the goddess of the hunt and she's very often shown with a dog. Sometimes this was less obvious. 
So this is a Hellenistic figurine on the bottom right here of Anubis, who is an Egyptian deity. Anubis was a popular deity in Hellenistic Greece as a figure of death. And the sort of connection between dogs and death in ancient Greece was a very, very old one, in part as Homer sort of intimates, because Greeks sometimes would see dogs eating corpses on battlefields. And so it's sort of a natural sort of um, connection to be drawn between dogs and the afterlife. We can also see this in the goddess Hecate, who's in this weird figurine at the top left here. She's sort of a triple body goddess, but you can see a hound, a very distinct collar right between two of her bodies. And Plutarch, who was a Roman priest during the Roman period, tells us that nearly all the Greeks used a dog as a sacrificial victim for ceremonies of purification. Some at least make use of it even to this day. They bring forth for Hecate puppies along with other materials for purification. And up at the top right, we can actually see these are the skulls of dogs that were probably sacrificed in purification rituals in Athens. So this is one of those cases where we can see uh, direct links between our archeological evidence and our literary sources. But I don't wanna end on that sort of sad note. So I wanna come back to this burial here at the bottom right that we started uh, briefly alluded to earlier in this discussion. Um, this dog here was buried in the Athenian Agora and whoever put him in the ground left with him a very large beef bone right at his mouth. So somebody wanted to make sure that he was well fed in the afterlife also. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, please go to People in the Past. We've got more information about this topic in particular and videos and other information on plenty of other topics. Thank you. <laughs>